Imagine a projectile that arrives so fast it leaves no smoke trail, no sonic boom you can localize, only a sudden catastrophic impact, seven times faster than sound. No flash, no rocket plume, no physics. This is not a film prop. This is a railgun, an idea that turns electricity into the speed of war. Today, we ask a simple, urgent question, one that sits at the crossroads of technology, geopolitics, and budgets. When allies start building what you once abandoned, does your government sit back and watch progress as it climb back into the ring? Specifically, will the United States, which paused its railgun program in 2021, rejoin the race now that partners like Japan are testing the same dream? And what would it mean if the future of naval combat depends less on missiles and more on generating, storing, and firing raw megawatts of electrical energy? To understand why this matters, we need to rewind. The railgun is deceptively simple in concept, radical in execution. Instead of burning propellant, it uses electromagnetic rails to accelerate a projectile to hypervelocity. That means incredible range, pinpoint accuracy, and, crucially, dramatically lower cost per shot than a cruise missile. A railgun round is essentially a dart, not a rocket, which can be made cheaply, launched fast, and hit hard. The United States fell in love with that promise. Research began decades ago with university labs and defense research centers chasing plasma dynamics, rail materials, and power delivery. By the 2000s, the Navy was serious, building produced tens of megajoules of muzzle energy. In the future, where close-in defenses used lasers, mid-range engagements used rail guns, and long-range strikes were handled by lasers. But engineering is a brutal teacher. The railgun asked ships to become floating power plants, able to produce, store, and route tens of megawatts on demand. It chewed through rails and barrels, it demanded capacitor banks the size of shipping containers, and its true rate of fire fell short of grand ambitions. The Zumwalt class, designed with vast electrical capacity in mind, promised a path forward, but its costs ballooned, and the fleet was reduced from dozens to just a handful. By 2021, funding for naval rail gun development was cut, and the weapon drifted from program of record to intriguing footnote. Yet the thread did not while the U.S. stepped back, other nations kept pulling, testing, and iterating. Enter Japan. Surrounded by potential threats, from North Korea's missile tests, to an increasingly assertive China in the East and South China Seas, Tokyo has been intensifying its search for high-tech, high-throughput defensive systems. In labs and shipyards, Japanese engineers asked the same question American scientists once asked. What if we could accelerate a small, cheap projectile to hypersonic speeds and do it reliably? repeatedly, at sea. Their experiments took a pragmatic tack. Instead of chasing the ultimate 64 megajoule dream right away, they built up the technology stack slowly. Smaller calibers, smarter materials, improved rail metallurgy, and modular capacitor banks that could be tested on shore before being mounted on a test ship. The result, according to testing reports, was a railgun that delivered thousands of feet per second for many sustained shots, while showing lower erosion than earlier experiments. That last part matters. Rail and barrel barriers need railgun's Achilles heel. The reason you could have one spectacular test shot, but not a sustained combat system. Why does this matter to the U.S.? Because the calculus of modern naval warfare has changed. Missiles remain potent, but they are expensive, and they rely on supply chains and complex guidance. Hypersonic weapons have their own cost and strategic complications. A railgun promises a layer no missile can cheaply fill an ability to engage incoming munitions or hit land and sea targets at range, with thousands of potential shots for the price of a single missile. But the technology is not magic, it is logistics. A 32 megajoule shot, for example, translates into raw electricity demands that most current destroyers and frigates cannot meet without significant redesign. You either retrofit and give up something else, or you build ships around big energy plants. That choice affects not only cost, but doctrine. A ship optimized for electromagnetic weapons will look different, fight different, and project power differently. There's a second political dimension. Defense research is rarely a solo national game. It is expensive, and it thrives on industrial cooperation. Japan's advances opened the door for collaboration. Engineers and officials speak a common language of specs, capacitors, rails, and fatigue cycles. Invitations have been extended to foreign contractors in some programs, and European partners have signaled interest in joint development. For a U.S. defense establishment that values interoperability with allies, such partnerships are an enticing shortcut back into the game. So, what would it take for the U.S. to re-enter railgun development in earnest? First, a strategic decision that the capability is worth the trade-offs. That is not merely a technical call, it is a political one. 
involving Congress, shipbuilding advocates, and service planners. Second, a commitment to build the right hulls or retrofit enough ships to provide the necessary power, storage, and space. Third, targeted investments to solve the railgun's core problems, like barrel wear, cooling, and integration with guidance or secondary sensors. We should also talk about the economics and why the railgun kept its allure. A single hypervelocity projectile might cost tens of thousands of dollars compared to multi-million dollar missiles. Multiply that across a conflict and the math becomes compelling. In a saturation attack, where dozens or hundreds of incoming objects threaten a fleet or coastal asset, the ability to fire many cheap, fast rounds could be decisive. But there are no guarantees. The military's tilt toward hypersonics and directed energy was not ideological, it was pragmatic. Hypersonic glide vehicles promise ranges and flight profiles that a railgun cannot match today. Lasers offer new instant engagement against swarms at close range. If the railgun cannot outperform or complement these systems in a clear way, it risks becoming another expensive experiment, which brings us back to alliances. If Japan, France, and Germany are pooling resources, and if industry partners are willing to share advances, the U.S. can either join those efforts and benefit, or it can watch allies develop a capability that reshapes naval doctrine. Allies do not always align perfectly with U.S. needs, but shared technological advances can be rapidly adapted. That incentive structure, the fear of being left behind and the lure of shared development costs, could be the impetus that pulls the U.S. back into railgun work. There is also an operational angle view like to discuss openly. A railgun, at scale, changes how you think about escalation. If you can hit a target at long range with near-zero signature, you alter an adversary's calculus about retaliation, defense, and deterrence. That strategic effect can be stabilizing or destabilizing, depending on doctrine, transparency, and arms control norms. It is a debate that should be had in daylight, not only in classified briefings. So, what is the likely path forward? Realistically, a hybrid approach. The U.S. is unlikely to abandon its investments in hypersonics and lasers. But a targeted, allied-centered program that focuses on solving the railgun's remaining engineering problems while building modular power systems for future ships is entirely plausible. Congress may be persuaded by a coalition pitch where allies cost share development and provide test beds, reducing the U.S.'s budget burden while preserving its industrial lead. In the short term, expect more experiments, more joint trials, and more lobbyist arguments about ship design and industrial jobs. In the medium term, we may see a niche deployment on vessels specifically designed to host electromagnetic weapons or on shore installations that provide fire support and missile defense. And in the long term, if materials, power management, and guidance integration improve, the railgun could take its place in layered defenses, exactly as its early proponents envisioned. This is more than a weapons story. It is a story about how nations manage innovation, how they decide which technological dreams are worth the cost, and how alliances can either accelerate or retard progress. The railgun is a test case, a bellwether for a military ecosystem that must juggle budgets, strategy, and the raw physics of war. So, where do you stand? Should the United States dive back into railgun development with allies and accept the trade-offs that come with building ships as power plants? Or should it continue to prioritize hypersonics and lasers, letting partners experiment while it watches from the sidelines? The answer will shape not only the next generation of naval platforms, but the way naval power is projected across oceans for decades to come. If you enjoyed this investigation, leave a comment with which side you think should win and why and subscribe for more deep dives into the technology shaping tomorrow's battlefields. Thanks for watching, and we will see you in the next episode, where we examine the ship designs that might finally make electromagnetic weapons practical at sea.